Good morning. This is Melissa Buckley again with the Multifamily Upgrade Program. We're going to go ahead and get started on our webinar for today, which will cover the basics of commercial real estate transactions. We've got John Rockwell, the National Client Manager at Partner Energy with us. Partner Energy has been delivering a number of trainings in the Multifamily Upgrade Program over the past couple of years, so we're excited to have him presenting to you today. So first, we'll just go over some of the basics of GoToWebinar and how to use the menu on your screen. If you're not familiar with it, you can see that this points out how to minimize the pain, how to raise your hand. It's that little hand symbol there. If you're using your telephone, make sure you enter the audio pin at the end of the call if you um, need to ask any questions. You can use the questions box at the bottom or raise your hand. We do have a few section breaks in the presentation where we can take questions if we have many. Otherwise, we'll wait till the end. So if you need any support, feel free to raise your hand or, or send a message. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John and let him tell you a little bit about himself and get us started for the day. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Um, thank you for having me and letting me explain to you some of the foundational concepts and basics of uh, the commercial real estate world as it applies to multifamily and asset management. Like Melissa mentioned, I work at Partner Energy. I've, I've worked here for the last six years or so, and we are a full-service energy consulting firm that helps commercial real estate owners achieve their sustainability and energy efficiency goals in whatever manner that may materialize for that particular owner. But in, in my prior life, prior to Partner Energy, I was a asset manager for a private equity real estate investment firm in West Los Angeles. And the asset management team I was a part of we, we managed probably half half a billion dollars in commercial real estate over a five-year period. And it was just, uh, I, I left just as the market was going south in 2008, 2009. So we got to see a lot of the sort of hypothetical downside scenarios that are often discussed uh, play out in reality. So I'm hoping I can use that as context to provide additional clarity uh, for everyone on the call today into some of the ins and outs of, of, of what goes through an asset manager's head as they do their day-to-day -day job. So as most of you are probably aware, this is a four-part course taking place over a consecutive number of months. We're doing one class a month. This is day number one or session number one. And these are the five macro-level topics that we would like to cover over the four courses themselves. Today we're going to focus on the basics of commercial real estate and how that applies to multifamily and, and from an asset manager's perspective. We're going to follow that up with an introduction to the valuation methodology, how do asset managers value real estate and the energy efficiency projects associated with programs like uh, the, the PG&E and UP program. And Thirdly, we're going to dive deeper into the valuation methodology, and that's the pro forma process. And that's really that's really going to be the beating heart of this program. We're going to take a lot of time to delve into what the pro forma process really is and a lot of the financial levers that go into assumptions and decision making and how, uh, how asset managers are informed when they and the owners of real estate are making their short and long term uh, decisions for how to manage the property. Lastly, we're going to take a deviation from the hardcore financial analysis portion of the course and talk a little bit about the Investor Confidence Project. It's a exciting new initiative that is looking to bridge the gap between the, the financial and analytical life of asset managers and owners and the boots on the ground, vendors, and energy audit providers, 
and efficiency upgrade providers that are doing work on properties themselves. And it, it really strives to be a communication tool between those two stakeholders and getting them to trust each other and communicate with each other better. And so we'll spend a, a, a nice, nice amount of time talking about that and any other sort of relative uh, initiatives in the, uh, in the industry as well. And following that is a review of the MUP measures themselves and their effect on an asset manager's view of the property and how they motivate asset managers to move forward in the decision-making process, sort of a capstone to hopefully bring everything together and tie it in with, uh, with the MUP uh, measures themselves. So for today, the basics of commercial real estate, it can be broken down into three specific agenda items. We're going to be covering the real estate business cycle itself, spending a good amount of time on what that really means and how that affects the motivations of owners and asset managers. Then we'll look at the roles and responsibilities that an asset manager has to work within uh, that real estate business cycle on any given asset or any given building. And then we'll delve, delve deeper in the details of how they accomplish those responsibilities using specific tasks and specific tools uh, at, their, at their disposal. So another way to look at it is think of it as a funnel. We're going to start at our most wide and talk about the industry itself and all of the external factors that, that play into how the real estate cycle influences all of, our, all of our professional lives and then drilling down into the roles, into the tasks, and ultimately the tools to accomplish all of that. So let's not waste any time. Let's get started with the industry itself. So taking a step back, what is commercial real estate at its most basic form and its most basic definition? Simply, commercial real estate is income generating property and or land. This income can come in one of two forms. It can be a rental income that is given to the owner over regular periods, over a given or potentially infinite uh, period of time. This is like what the apartment renter cuts their check to the landlord every month. And then we have gain on sale. This is a sale of a property at a certain fixed point in the future and hopefully you're selling it for more than you bought it for and you're recognizing or appreciating income via that gain on sale. I think the most practical example of this that we're all familiar with is on the single family home side. We have all been through it ourselves, either on the buying and selling side or we know someone who's gone through it. It's holding that real estate and selling that real estate with the, with the hope and intent of obviously selling it for more than you're buying it. Now, the single family home example is not great because that's not technically commercial real estate, but the mechanics and the motivation are exactly the same. So when we talk about commercial real estate in that regard, 99% of the time we're referring to four macro level asset classes or building types. When we say commercial real estate, we're referring to office, industrial, retail, or multifamily. There are some caveats and sub-classifications within that. Multifamily, for example, nearly universally, at least in the U.S., it's four or more units. So a single-family home renting out a, a third bedroom, that would generally not be considered commercial real estate. And likewise, retail and industrial, those are very broad categories that have many different subclassifications. Obviously, retail can mean anything from the big box retail store, the Costco, the Walmart, to the neighborhood mom and pop strip mall, you know, the 800 square foot uh, dry cleaner in it. Uh, that all falls under the retail bucket and it's treated the same way in terms of the basic principles of asset management. The business cycle of real estate is similar to any other economic cycle that we've probably 
all experienced ourselves, what we've read about or heard on the news, the, the dot-com boom and bust in the 90s, the more relevant, more recent mortgage financial crisis of the 2007-2008. If you've seen the big short, the movie, uh, that dives into some of the motivations behind that uh, bust of, uh, of that cycle. But generally, I think academically, the real estate cycle is considered one of the more dramatic business cycles. They all follow the boom and bust riding of a wave, uh, but, but real estate, you can pretty much depend on it being uh, pretty, pretty volatile. It'll have high highs and low lows, and everyone's trying to look out on the horizon to see where we are and, and, and not, not, not get caught off guard of any, of any economic cliff that we fall off of. So what phases are we referring to when we talk about the business cycle of real estate? These are the four phases that are found in any business cycle, and they are particularly germane to real estate as well. There's the recovery phase, the expansion phase, the oversupply or hypersupply phase, and last but not least, the recession phase. And this is usually visualized on a bit of a sine wave, a bit of a roller coaster uh, line, line graph. And we can see here it starts at recovery, it trends up into expansion, it peaks oversupply starts to come in and we ride that roller coaster wave down into a recession hopefully coming back out in a recovery on the other end and not hopefully we always do but all of these phases can take their own amount of time they're not always an equal period like it's displayed here it's not always three months of recovery three months of expansion etc it could be 10 years of recovery, one year of expansion, one year of oversupply, and then five years of recession. All these, all these phases move at their own pace. Another, another way of thinking about this real estate cycle that I personally like is not looking at it as a chart like this, but as a 12-hour clock. And this has the similar four phases of recovery, boom, slow down, and recession or slump. But in this case, it's obviously very visually continuous. You can you can make the clear connection that there's never you're never stuck in one phase of the cycle forever. It's it, it's a, it's a, it's an infinite loop and we can see the market's peak is at 12 noon. The end of the slowdown, the beginning of the slump begins at three o'clock, the bottom of the market is at six. We ramp up into recovery at nine and we enjoy a boom you know, frothy jubilant market between nine and twelve and that that that's a universal uh, layout for this clock the business cycle as a clock so you may naturally be thinking where are we on this clock maybe many of you already know maybe some of you have no idea but I think generally academics and financial prognosticators, they, they think that we are somewhere here in, in this box. We're, we're at the end of the recovery, entering the boom market. Um, if you ask the sort of most optimistic uh, economic forecaster, or if you talk to somebody who's a little more pessimistic, they, they say, yes, we've, we've been through all that already. We are now in the midst of a boom market. In fact, we might even be at the edge of this red uh, red box looking at the 12 o'clock peak on the horizon we can see it coming but that's very subjective no one can tell the future obviously so where we are is is always up for debate until we have the luxury of hindsight and it, it should be noted that the previously mentioned four asset classes of commercial real estate the office industrial the retail, the multifamily, they don't all move in lockstep, sort of continuing the clock analogy, they don't all move with a single minute hand or hour hand through this clock. The multifamily will have its own hour hand and it's tracking along at a certain pace. The office will have its own hour hand and it's tracking along at its own pace. 
they don't they don't differ wildly from one another. They all are probably within this box, but they're but they're certainly not moving in in complete unison in complete lockstep. But again, you won't have one at nine and one at three. So just keep that in mind. Spending a little more time delving into each phase of this business cycle and what it means for real estate now that we're now that we're looking at it with our asset manager hats on and what this means to me as a commercial real estate asset manager. Let's look at recovery. For in a recovering market, we see decreasing vacancy rates. And I, I think I'll, I'll I'll pause here and, and sort of lay lay out a a hypothetical scenario that I think will serve us well to to continually refer to throughout this hour. So when we're all sitting here pretending to be asset managers, hypothetically speaking of a of a of a project going through this cycle, I think I think it makes sense to have an asset manager that has been given a multifamily apartment building and the ownership has said we are going to do a specific renovation plan on this multifamily building. We're going to renovate the units. We're going to reposition where this building is within the market. We're going to try to raise its rents and, and do this renovation plan and make it worth more money in the market. And then we're going to try to sell it five years from now. So in the back of your mind, you know, just, just know that that's the general uh, hypothesis or, or scenario that we're referring to. So with, with that building, this asset manager in the recovery market is going to see decreasing vacancy rates. They're going to start getting more applications for, from prospective renters. And if vacancy is going to go down, obviously the occupancy is going to go up. The, the city that this building is, is in, the asset manager is going to look around and not see too much new construction yet because construction is usually going to lag behind other sort of key uh, business cycle factors. Because while, while I as a asset manager working with a landlord can easily so raise rents with my new tenant applications or can easily see my occupancy going up, it's a much slower, much more complicated process for a developer to see this landscape as a recovery, as a recovering landscape, and decide to want to build a building. They have to wait six months to get building permits. They have to wait uh, two months to get plans from the architect and mobilize everything. So while I, as a landlord, are immediately seeing this as a recovery market, my pal, the developer, it's going to take them 12 to 18 months to take advantage of that recovery market and even break, break ground. So. That's why we see low new construction. Moderate absorption. Absorption refers to those new units that the developer puts on the market. How quickly are they staying on the market versus how quickly are they being rented by a new prospective tenant? So any projects that do happen to be coming online during this phase, we're seeing them rent out pretty quickly. Moderate absorption. They're not staying on the market a long time. We're also seeing negative to low rental rate growth. That's primarily due to an inverse relationship with vacancy rates. So as an asset manager talking to the landlord, we're excited that our occupancy is increasing. We're excited that our rent roll has a lot more uh, tenants on it. But we're not to the point yet where we feel like there's a overwhelming demand that's encouraging us to raise our rent. We're still trying to fill the building before we start jacking up the price that we're going to charge as a uh, as a rent as a rentor to potential rentees. Then, lastly, all of all of the phases of the business cycle are subject to massive external forces. None none of these cycles, be it real estate or otherwise, uh, operate in a vacuum. Operate in a silo. Of their given industry. So the real estate cycle is subject to external factors. For this exercise, for this demonstration, we're focusing on employment growth as a as a influencer, as a motivator to some of the some of the trends that we're seeing in this real estate cycle. So right now during the recovery phase, we're seeing low 
to moderate employment growth. People are getting hired, that number is going up, everyone's getting excited. In the expansion phase, we see a lot of continuation of the trends that we started to notice in the recovery phase. Vacancy rates continue to decrease. That's fantastic. I'm thrilled as an asset manager. I'm, I'm high-fiving my landlord. Things are going great. Uh, we, see, we see now, when we look out across the city's landscape, that developers are starting to take note of this, and they're able to get new projects off the ground. The, the banks are starting to lend them money. Their, their, their equity partners are starting to get excited about new projects, and they've gotten through that red tape of, of development. And we're seeing that property that was once a parking lot, now it's dirt and there's a crane and they're starting to build. And we're seeing moderate to high levels of this. A, a, a perfect real world example right now is if you've looked at downtown Los Angeles over the last 24 months, you, you can't turn around without seeing a new crane over what was formerly a parking lot now becoming a mid to high rise residential building. At any given time, there's probably a dozen, dozen cranes dotting the skyline in downtown LA. Additionally, we're continuing to see sort of the, the maximum absorption that we're going to see in the real estate cycle. Every new project that is coming online is seeing its units gobbled up. If it's a rental project, we're seeing it, it hit its projected um, occupancy very quickly. If it's a for sale project, we're seeing it sell its, uh, its units uh, equally as quickly. Likewise, the medium to high rental growth rate, like I mentioned, it's, it's, its relationship to vacancy. Now, as a asset manager talking with my landlord, we've been seeing vacancy in our building decrease for so long that we're now full. We, we're, we're at 95% occupancy at any given point in time, maybe 100% occupancy. It's like, is this the luxury? to now re-examine our rental rate. And when we are in sort of the driver's seat in terms of supply and demand, this is a market that is considered a demand-driven market. We, we're, we're trying to give enough supply to a market that is demanding more rental units, more purchase units. So in that, in that dynamic, we're able to raise our rents in response because we're, otherwise we're just turning down applications left and right, so a natural response is to just make it more exclusive, make it more expensive. External factors, the employment growth can be a moderate and high level of employment growth. The general economy is great and everyone is feeling very exuberant. It's a boom, it's officially a boom market and things are going very well. Inevitably though, we will hit the top of that peak. We will go over the top hill of the roller coaster and start on our way down. And what is really happening here is the, is the classic economic supply and demand equation. Because everyone over the last cycle has been seeing this, this intense demand and this lack of supply, everyone has decided to get in on the supply side. And so new buildings are everywhere and landlords are, are, are renting full buildings at, at higher rents than ever before. And inevitably, there's a tipping point. And so now we are in an oversupply market. There's demand. Maybe it's purely oversupply. There's just too many suppliers. But jumping down to the bottom, it can also be an external factor driven. Maybe it wasn't a, a, a raw oversupply. Maybe that demand turned off or it didn't grow like we expected it to because something like employment growth has started to taper. There's a little more uncertainty in the economy, so people are, are, are not becoming renters. They're living at home longer or they're not becoming buyers. They're continuing to rent longer. Some type of external factor is now uh, making this an oversupply market even if it's because demand itself is dropping. So common sense wise we start to see uh, some familiar trends. The moderate and high new construction level still remains because the same reason we didn't see new construction uh, take off in 
going back in the recovery phase because it takes 18 months to ramp up. For that same reason, we are now seeing new construction continue to coast at high levels even though we're acknowledging that it's an oversupply market. You just can't put the brakes on a new construction project in a day, in a month. It takes a long time to unwind something like that or more often the developer will just commit to finishing the project because it's better to have a completed project than a half half completed project, uh, empty, empty plot of land. So we see new projects still coming on even though everyone acknowledges that it's an oversupply market. Subsequently, the units in those new construction projects that are coming online, they're not getting absorbed. Absorption may have slowed, absorption may have gone negative, and those buildings are sitting there relatively empty. Likewise, because there's so much supply now, I no longer as an asset manager talking with my landlord have the luxury of raising rent, rental rates. I might be able to grow it a little bit, might be able to grow it none at all. And lastly, I think everybody can see where this is going. We bottom out in a recession. This is the bottom of the barrel. This is, this is the bust of the boom and bust cycle. So vacancy rates continue to increase. Construction has finally caught up. Everyone has put the brakes on their projects or finished what projects they had in the works. And there's now no more new construction. But those buildings are still on the market and absorption is still low. Rental growth rates are low and negative as landlords continue to fight for what little demand there still is in the market. It becomes very competitive. Things have now flipped. It's a, it's a buyer's or renter's market. Demand has the leverage. External factors, low and negative employment growth, like I mentioned in the previous cycle, this may be a, an influencing factor. Uh, sort of driving this whole uh, driving this whole part of the real estate cycle. So, how how does this look overlaid onto the cycle curve? I, I think sort of the detail exercise that we just went through. You can see now that this makes a little more sense when we're looking at the first diamond to the second diamond we're in the recovery phase, so we're all enjoying a decreasing, declining vacancy. And you can see in that second diamond, we're now hitting our long-term occupancy average. And sorry, let me take a step back. So this is, this is the cycle plotted on a graph where occupancy is the vertical axis and time is the horizontal axis. So as we move in time, from the first diamond to the second diamond, we're enjoying an increase in occupancy in our building. As we move from the second to third diamond, you can see we've crossed our long-term vacancy average, so things are great. Maybe our building has traditionally been 85% occupied. Now, when we hit the second diamond, we're 85%, and to our delight and pleasant surprise, we're continuing to go up and up and up in occupancy as our vacancy continues to decline. Similarly, our buddy, the developer, is starting new construction, and inevitably we hit that third diamond, the aforementioned tipping point where supply and demand is just not in balance any longer, and we go back down. Vacancy increases, new construction finishes, and the market now has a glut of supply as demand has, has dried up and we are in a recession. So don't want to belabor this chart too much because I think it covers a lot of what we just talked about, but wanted to show you what it looks like with a focus on, on rents. And you can see the rents start out negative or
muted. Thing in their head, running on their on their feasibility uh, study sheet, and when rents get to a certain point, high enough certain point, it now makes sense for them to build a new building. It becomes cost feasible. So that's part of the reason why developers start to get momentum at the tail end of the recovery or at the beginning of the expansion phase. Now projects that didn't pencil out before at $1,000 per month per unit now do start to pencil out at $1,200 per month per unit or $1,300 per month per unit. So that brings them along. Maybe they, maybe they have better access to capital and it's easier to get loans, easier to find partners. All those things are influencing factors that make sense for them to jump in at this point in time. So a real world example of this, for argument's sake, nicely encapsulated is the decade from 1970 uh, to 1980. And I'm, I'm going to gloss over a lot of, of historical and outside economic factors to sort of make this a, an example that fits the, the box. So I apologize if anybody is a, is a historian and very familiar with this point in time, you'll probably want to uh, point out you know, many of the fallacies that I've glossed over. But in general, the start of the decade, 1970 to 1975, was a, a fantastic Boom! Uh, so they, they 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 were they were on the tail they were on the tail end of a boom market from the 60s. So there was an excess of capital in the market. Developers were building buildings as fast as they could to to enjoy the the demand that they saw in the market and the easy cheap capital that they had access to accomplish those projects. The as the decade unfolded, though, the demand that they were basing their assumptions off of dried up. All that 60s demand uh, went away. And it was exacerbated in roughly 1974 by an external factor, a general economic recession. So we saw things like the job growth decline, the access to money dry up, and all of these things were, were, were sort of negative influences to help push the market from sort of a soft oversupply into a recession where things were just you know, completely out of whack supply and demand wise. Uh, luckily, it didn't last very long. Uh, by 75, 76, uh, capital money for new construction projects had completely dried up. So there was no more, no more new construction happening in the market. And coincidentally, uh, the, the first generation of baby boomers who were born in the late 50s uh, became uh, uh, workers. They, they entered the professional um, workforce, and that caused demand to skyrocket. So in historical terms, in relative short order, the demand shot back up and was able to soak up all of that excess supply from the, the first half of the decade. So what, what could have been a very stagnant oversupply market became a relatively balanced supply and demand market in equilibrium where there were enough spaces for enough workers. In, in fact, things started, things continued to tighten and equalize until the market reached peak occupancy at the end of the decade in 1979, I think na nationwide we saw approximately 95% occupancy, 5% vacancy, which is just a, a incredible, incredible occupancy rate. And that is the end of the industry real estate cycle portion of the seminar or the presentation. So. Now, unless there are any really pertinent questions, I'm going to dive right into an asset manager's role within that framework that we just laid out.
So taking a step back, forgetting about real estate, what is asset management? It's a term that I've heard forever. It's a term that you all have probably heard throughout your day-to-day -day business. You know, what, what is it really? And I heard on the radio a couple weeks ago a really uh, great kind of funny definition of what asset management, asset management is at its core. What it is, it's the art of making more money out of existing money. So someone with a, with a nice chunk of change is giving you as an asset manager that money and their trust to make more of it over a given period of time. And that can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. We're not talking about a pile of cash. We're talking about wealth creation via stock via bonds, existing businesses or new businesses, and of course real estate itself, real estate asset managers. So when we're talking about the asset manager is managing that building, that's absolutely true in a literal sense, but what he's doing, he or she is doing in the most phil philosophical sense is taking someone's trust and someone's money and growing it to a certain degree over a certain period of time, and we'll get in and we'll get into the influencing factors later on of 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 how they come to that agreement and sort of what metrics the investors uh, judge the asset managers by to accomplish those goals. So functionally, one of the key things that the asset manager is doing in that in that wealth creation role is ensuring that the building, the asset that they've been entrusted, successfully rides the real estate wave wherever it is on the real estate cycle and making sure that it doesn't get derailed from the plan that the owners, the ownership, or the investors, whoever is the asset manager's boss, all agreed to when they decided to buy that building. So we see a typical flow chart here of the building's life cycle and the asset management purview and what they're really responsible for for that building. The building gets acquired and part of and part of one of the goals that I have for this course is to hopefully demystify some of the language associated with commercial real estate because like a lot of technical professions it's it's overly complicated and words that are used to describe simple processes are ramped up and become SAT words and it's unnecessarily obtuse and obscure to someone on the outside looking in. So when, when we talk about acquisitions, all, all we're talking about is, is buying a building, plain and simple. When we talk about the last circle, a disposition, all we're talking about is the sale. So when you say I'm disposing of an asset, that's really a fancy white collar way of saying I'm selling my building for no good reason other than you want to sound smarter than you actually may be in reality. When we talk about what asset managers' roles are for the bottom two quarters of the big circle in the middle, it's property management, supervising property managers, and it's executing the repositioning and value enhancement of that asset. So think back to the hypothetical building that I asked you all to keep in mind at the beginning, the multifamily building that was bought that is going to have its units renovated. Those units get sold to, or those units get leased to tenants at a higher lease rate. And then because it's a better performing building, it can now be sold in the future for more than we bought it. That's all the repositioning and value enhancement is. And if you want to think about it as a, a grand HGTV exercise, all we're really talking about is flipping a building. You know, just like you'd flip a house, we're just flipping an apartment building. So we're buying and we're flipping by the improvement of the building 
and the ultimate sale for more than we bought it for. That's 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 what's really going on. So to make that to make that happen, there, there's there's a property hierarchy for how we look at the building's data, the key metrics, how we look at the building's operations, how we look at um, the the building's sort of life life cycle plan and how it's being executed. So this this, this hierarchy, uh, I feel like it does a pretty good job of rolling the foundational pieces up to one another until we ultimately get to the ownership. So when we're talking about the most basic boots on the ground level of building management and ass, you know, asset management, we're, we're talking about the facility data. And that's primarily controlled, monitored, taken ownership of by the building engineers. They're the ones that see the BMS system every day. They're the ones that knock on the boiler, that see the submeters down in the mechanical room. Uh, they're, they're the ones that are, are literally the boots on the ground. That, that facility data does not operate in a bubble or in a vacuum, or at least it shouldn't. It's all part of a broader life cycle management and ultimately sort of performance indicator roll up. And that's something that the property managers are most concerned with. When a property manager is working hand in hand or reporting to an asset manager, one of their key deliverables, one of their key communicators are the building's performance indicators and how they're performing their job of life cycle management for that building. So in 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 a lot of private equity situations where you have an asset manager who's managing half a dozen or a dozen buildings, they they hire third party property managers. So it's not you know if, if I'm the asset manager of ABC Financial, I'm not talking to a property manager that's an ABC Financial employee. I'm probably talking to a property manager that is part of CBRE or JLL, some firm that we've hired that their sole business, their, their expertise is property management and they report to me all these financial indicators and all of this life cycle management data. So where does that leave the asset manager? Well, it's not the owner up on top. So the asset manager is thinking about strategic decisions and tactical decisions in terms of executing the owner's vision for that building. And of course, the owner sits back and enjoys all this and watch, watches the process happen and enjoys the wealth creation that the asset manager is providing. But let's talk a little bit about what we mean by strategic and tactical decision making within this property hierarchy. And that's going to lead that's going to lead exactly into the specific tasks that an asset manager is is expected to incorporate into his or her roles and responsibilities. So for strategic decision making, and, and this is obviously painting with a broad brush. So I'm I'm happy to talk offline about you know any questions that you have about you know what this really means, but strategic decision making at its most basic is an execution of the acquisition plan. So in our scenario, the acquisition plan is simply we bought this multifamily building for X amount. You have this much money to renovate the units with. We expect you to hit these rents and we expect you to sell it for a certain amount at a certain time. That's the plan. It's all laid out for you. The team of underwriters, the team of, of acquisition uh, salesmen and investment committees and all, the, all these people that, that see the building's performance and plan before it gets to the asset manager, they've all made these decisions for the asset manager and they drop it on their desk and say, execute this plan. Okay, simple enough. So. One of the key metrics, though, for communicating how I'm doing in that plan is the internal rate of return, and it's part of a discounted cash flow model, a DCF model. And, th and that is really a key metric for communicating to ownership or the investors that the owner is working with 
how we're doing on that wealth creation goal that we've been tasked with. You know, it's similar to a, a similar to a ROI, return on investment, or sort of a, a, any kind of you know, how much money do I put in, how much money do, do I get out metric that you might be familiar with. But it has its own special sort of quirks about it, and we'll get into that in much more detail in uh, lectures two and three. Of course, the third bullet point, capital preservation and risk avoidance, that is, is critical. All the stakeholders in this process are generally pretty conservative business people. They don't like ultra-risky investments. If they did, they probably wouldn't have bought this building. They probably would have gone invested in a Silicon Valley startup. So when we say our job is wealth creation, you owner, you investor are going to give us $1 and we're going to give you back $2. That's great if we can do that. If things go sideways, if the plan goes off plan, if external factors crash the market, our new job becomes capital preservation. So we can say to the owner, to the investor, well, we're not going to get you $2 on that $1, but at the very least, we're going to give you back your dollar and not give you back 50 cents. So then we be, become focused on capital preservation. And within that, there's the adapting of an exit strategy, aka sale, aka disposition plan, as it's needed. So in a perfect world, that acquisition plan that was dropped on our desk, we can execute that beautifully. No stress, no risk. It happens exactly according to plan. Of course, in real life, that hardly ever happens. And so we're going to have to adapt a new exit strategy, new sale strategy to meet the IRR and formal rate of return capital preservation goals as needed as we navigate the bump of real estate and economic factors along the way. So tactical decision making, that's taking these strategic goals and dialing them down into some, some real tactics. The renovation plan progress monitoring, that is making sure our renovation plan is going according to how everyone saw fit, either on a monthly, daily, weekly basis, whatever the plan uh, deems necessary. And working with property managers on lease rates in a coherent marketing approach to make those lease rates happen, to hit those lease rate goals that the acquisition plan laid out. Working with the property manager hand in hand, uh, doing some property manager oversight, you know, you effectively you know, become their boss, for lack of a better word. And of course, sale price and marketing approach. The same idea as devising lease rates and, and marketing plans for those lease rates, that same logic is applied to the ultimate sale price, whether it's three years, five years, seven years down the road, whatever has been agreed to by the ownership. This takes the form of certain day-to-day -day responsibilities. Over morning coffee, you might be monitoring the revenue and expense trends for all of, your, all of your assets that you manage. Additionally, you're looking at short and long-term capital planning, which is simply, do the owners and investors know how much money is going to be needed for each of these buildings to have the plan executed? And did what I think last month uh, remain true today, or has something changed? Communicate all of this to the other stakeholders, most importantly, the ownership and the investors. And then again, oversight of property level management. And last but not least, and, and really where this course is going to leap off from in the days to come, is evaluation of off-plan assets. Because with an off-plan asset, we, the asset managers, now become the underwriters and the acquisition team. That acquisition plan that was dropped on our desk that says, please execute this, for an off-plan asset, that gets thrown in the trash. And the ownership asks you, the asset manager, to come up with a new plan to make this asset, quote unquote, on plan. So you're now responsible to do a complete re-underwriting of the building and present all of the factors and all of the assumptions that the original underwriting team had to do, but now you're doing it again because things have gone wrong and you need a new plan. So what tools are available to the asset manager to make that happen? 
the asset evaluation plan for an off-plan asset generally is encompassed by these six things. A site analysis, broadly speaking, we take a step back and we look at the site. Maybe if it's an existing multifamily building, like the example we've been following along, this is almost irrelevant because it's just it's just a building. It's always been a building since we've we've owned it. So that's great. But if it's new construction, if it's a plot of dirt that we were planning on building something on, we may need a more intensive site analysis. The initial concept, we take a step back and reevaluate the initial concept. Are we doing the right thing given today's market forces, given where this building stands today? And we can't answer that until we go into these next four items. We need to do a demand analysis. So when we're thinking about that real estate curve, that the top of the real estate cycle being where supply and demand is in equilibrium, we need to do a demand analysis of our local market and see what people want. What are they asking? Are people still trying to rent units at $1,200, $1,300 a month? Or has there been an external factor like job, job loss that makes it so people don't want that anymore? Similarly, the supply analysis, what are all my competitors doing? Are there 10 buildings on my block that are all doing the exact same thing as I am? Or do I have a bit of supply advantage where I'm the only building in the market that is operating like this? From that, we can start to get an idea of the initial concept and that, and that materializes itself as a specific development and hold scheme. So when we talk about renovating the units, bringing them to a certain market rate, and then holding onto the property for three, four, five, seven years. That's what we're talking about with the hold scheme. And then, of course, how much is this all going to cost? Is it going to cost what I originally thought it would? Or are there new overruns? Are things cheaper? Probably not. But are things more expensive? Have I changed the plan to such a material degree that I need to throw out my old cost estimates and start over again. These are all things to keep in mind. So the physical tools to start collecting all this data and making this analysis and presentation are property level budgets. How much money is coming in at the property today? How much money is going out at the property today? What is my net operating income, past, present, and future? Market data, this is how I derive those, those ideas about number three and four, the demand and supply analysis. The market data tells me what demand is. It tells me what my competitors are doing. It hopefully tells me with a broad sense, where am I in the real estate cycle? And of course, third party professional data, we take the technical data again, we get appraisals, we do due diligence site assessments, is, is, there, is the sto soil still non-toxic as I thought it was? And then last but not least, we look at the pro forma. And the pro forma is the central nervous system of this whole off-plan asset building evaluation. The pro forma is the financial tool that we use to decide what our investment path going forward is going to be for this property. We put in all of those assumptions, the demand assumptions, the supply assumptions, the cost assumptions, how much money we've spent to date, how much money we're, we're willing to spend in the future, and all of this is run through the pro forma, usually a big Excel file with a lot of different inputs, a lot of different formulas, and a lot of different calculations, and it tells us now what our wealth creation for the owner and investor is going to be. So we look at the pro forma to tell us what the IRR is going to be for those stakeholders. And if it's at a certain threshold, we can be comfortable and present a good, good path forward to them. So the three critical components to IRR are initial investment in, cash flow out over a period of time, you know, those, those rent checks coming in, and then lastly, what we're selling the building for in the market. So in closing, a small preview of one slice of a pro forma. 
I found this online. This isn't ours. This is a public domain Google search version of a pro forma. Uh, but, but what I like about it is that it's comparing the current reality of the building to what our pro forma estimates are. So it sort of encapsulates the, the philosophy behind what the ownership is looking for. They look to the pro forma to tell them how things are going to happen at the property. So maybe this is a monthly report that the stakeholders get, the owners, the investors get. And they can see that rental rates are better in some cases than pro forma, worse uh, in others. And they can see what the uh, expected performance of the building is, how much revenue is going to come in, how much expense is going to go out, and how that translates into uh, net operating income and, and return for me in terms of wealth creation. And so it, I, this isn't here to dive into details and, and explain everything. It's just to give you a little taste of what we will be doing in future uh, presentations. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. And I thank everyone for attending and listening. And I hope it wasn't uh, too boring. But in future courses, we're going to be diving a lot deeper into the technical aspects of all of this. We're going to be doing pro forma calculations from scratch. We're going to be reviewing the vocabulary and the terminology associated with all of these financial metrics and terms. And at the end of the third course, we're going to give you a pro forma Excel file to take home to do an underwriting yourself. And we can come back in the fourth course and revisit it in great detail and go over it as much as you want. So. Thank you very much. I, I hope this was helpful. It was a lot of fun. Um, Melissa, back back to you. Great. Thank you, John. I think that everybody really enjoyed the presentation. I actually got some comments along the way saying, wow, this is great. So we thank you all for attending. Some of you have asked if we will have this presentation available. Yes, we will. We have recorded it. It will be on the Multifamily Upgrade Program website. And uh, we can send that out to all of the attendees so that you can access it as soon as it's ready. I did just want you to also make sure to mark your calendars for the next session, which will be on October 12th, where we'll go into part two. So we have just a couple minutes left um, before the hour. And you'll see that that's the website and uh, our email address and phone number if you'd like to reach out individually. We can take some questions if anyone has any. Feel free to raise your hand. We'll hang on for just a minute. Just more compliments to you, John, coming in saying what a great presentation this was. I don't think Thank I you. see any other, yeah, uh, I don't think I see any other questions. Okay, then you'll all receive the link to the next registration opportunity for the October training. We'll be sending out an email about two weeks prior to each of the sessions. So look for that towards the end of the month and then subsequent registrations to follow, you know, through October and November. The this four part asset management series will repeat in October, November, and December, well, the, the following sessions. Looks like we, we did have one question come in, John, that I'll direct to you. How has the increase in building code standards in the past decade or so uh, affected the real estate curve as it relates to the supply-demand equilibrium point? Oh, that's that's an interesting question. I, I think b building code fa falls under one of those fixed costs, almost a sunk cost. And, and when I say that, I, I mean that it's just the cost of doing business. So when a developer looks at a project, so going back to, if I may, um, Apologize for the rewinding here. But when, when we look at this graph, 
and we go back to that green dot, probably the most the most tangible effect is that any aggressive building code, market pioneering building code, is probably going to push that green dot higher. So a developer that may be willing to build an apartment building in Texas is probably looking for $850 average rent per unit per month. But if they go somewhere like Oregon or California, all other factors being equal, I know there's a lot of external cost of living that are affecting this, but all other things being equal, if California building code is so stringent that it's going to increase the cost to build by 20%, they're going to be looking at the market and waiting for rents to not be 850, but they're going to wait for rents to be 1050, 1150, 1250 uh, to make it pencil out. But other than that, I, I think generally the same developers compete against each other in markets that they're familiar with. And so they all, they all have come to expect a certain level of expense to satisfy the building code requirements. So I don't think it has a, a sort of monumental shift in terms of the real estate cycle itself. It's, it's one of those inevitable costs of doing business that shows up in small financial fluctuations when you compare cost to build in market versus market. But overall, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a negligible effect on the, on the real estate cycle itself. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I see it's 12.02, so I think we'll let you all get to lunch. Thanks again, John, and all of you, please stay tuned uh, to your emails for the next registration and, and when the recording will be available. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.